to the, the January 2021. Live Welcome to the is on. <laughs> Welcome to the January 2021 meeting of the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. Uh, tonight we have our uh, a, a wonderful guest speaker and internet celebrity that's here to speak with us about the, the Mars uh, uh, Mars rover and uh, his accompanying air support system. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me hand it over to Coy for introductions. All right, thanks everybody for being on here tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Marty McGuire. He's a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. He's a fellow amateur astronomer, and he's known as Backyard Astronomy Guy on social media. So please, by all means, go to Instagram, Facebook, you name it, and like the guy, follow, post some really great stuff. He even does some local spots on his local uh, TV station, which is something I think we ought to invest some time in at some point in the future. Tonight, he's presenting the Mars 2020 mission overview for the Perseverance rover. So everybody give him your attention. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for having me. It's, uh, it's real fun to uh, uh, help be part of uh, show, you know, sharing the excitement of the, the Perseverance rover mission. It's been a long time since 2012 when the Curiosity rover landed. Um, I'm a, as a volunteer solar system ambassador, I'm over uh, one of over 1500 uh, folks in the country um, that love doing outreach uh, just in our spare time. So uh, I'm a full time uh, marketing manager during the day and uh, love doing this and amateur astronomy as a side hobby and it's just grown uh, and, into something that really lets me share my excitement for the night sky with a lot more folks and uh, just have a lot of fun doing it. So when there's not a pandemic, I'm usually doing uh, events in local, pan uh, local uh, public libraries for kids and families and talking about the space station and Mars rover missions, you know, really engaging stuff that's uh, uh, really exciting for, uh, for uh, local folks who uh, might not have heard about these missions otherwise or really been exposed too much to them. So uh, the pandemic's really certainly put a pinch on that kind of activity and I'm mostly on social media, but uh, Still sneaking outside when I can to uh, check out whatever the uh, night sky is sharing with us. We've had some pretty cool events this past year, and hopefully you've been all out uh, enjoying them as well. And with uh, Mars at its recent opposition and some pretty good views, I'm sure you all got, um, that is good timing every two years for us to launch something at Mars. Uh, so uh, the Perseverance rover is uh, headed out there. So without further ado, I'll launch my screen here. And on my other computer, it looks like I've got full screen uh, and I see the chat window on my other laptop. So if there is a, you know, this is a, I've got slides, but if you've got questions, please interrupt. Uh, you know, uh, try to stay on mute until then so we don't have any audio issues, but uh, go ahead, raise your hand. Uh, go ahead and uh, either chat. Uh, if somebody is in the chat and I've missed it, uh, Coy or, or somebody else, if you could, uh, you know, stop me uh, and uh, I'll, I'll answer questions along the way too. Um, okay, so, you know, this is coming up soon. Uh, landing Monday, February 18, uh, 2021. I think I got the day of the week right on that, I hope. Uh, and of course, no, I didn't. I must have looked at the wrong uh, Thursday, <laughs> February 18. I apologize. So, uh, messed that up already. Uh, the rest is pretty good in the presentation, but uh, it's a seven month journey uh, from when it launched in, on July 30th of 2020. So uh, the mission uh, you know, is, uh, you know, we've sent the Curiosity rover there, which is still going from 2012. You know, it, it had about a, a mission duration of about one year, but the Perseverance rover uh, is still, its goal is to seek signs of ancient life on Mars and collect samples of rock and regolith uh, for possible return to earth. Um, there's a new target this time uh, to land in Jezero Crater, uh, a place that holds a lot of promising uh, uh, potential evidence of past microbial life. So we're talking about finding life on Mars. It's not the green aliens. It's, it's microbial life and uh, remnants in the rocks and, and soil layers uh, by drilling, uh, much as you know, you'd find in a, a dry lake or riverbed here on Earth. Uh, the goal here is a mission duration of at least one Mars year, about 687 Earth days. But as we've seen from the Curiosity rover, they're quite durable. And even uh, uh, over uh, eight to nine years later, it's still trucking along and really it, it, with an extended mission. And really until the Curiosity's weaver, uh, wheels uh, fall off or get too damaged to keep going and get stuck in one spot, and then it's got a permanent home. It can probably still do science after that point. 
So there's four main science objectives for the Perseverance rover. Uh, geology, to study the rocks and landscape at its landing site and from wherever it can drive to, uh, to really uh, uh, get the region's history. Uh, water covered a lot of Mars millions and millions of years ago. So the sites they're going to uh, are just like our dry uh, lakes and riverbeds where fossils are, might be here on Earth. From astrobiology to determine whether an area of interest was suitable for life and to look for signs of ancient life itself, again, microbial life, uh, and uh, caching, you know, collecting samples uh, for the potential future return back to Earth on a future Mars mission. Uh, that would be a sample return mission. Also, the last one is to prepare for humans. You know, someday we're going to get to, uh, you know, have the first boots on Mars. And this is also going to help test a couple of technologies that would help sustain human presence on Mars someday. So trying to plan for now and in the future. So as of today, this is just a little bit ago, where is Perseverance? Well, it's uh, about 80, almost 85% of its way there. Um, it's got about uh, 45 million miles left. And I'll show you on this next slide. It's not a direct line. Um, you know, as we had Mars was at its closest last summer, uh, for us or, or last year. Um, Mars is closest to Earth about every two years. So it, there's specific timing, specific windows you can get to Mars without having to go to the other side of the sun. Um, so I'll provide a PDF of this afterwards with these hyperlinks in here for you to check out. But it's uh, cruising along at 50, almost 51,000 miles an hour on its way to Mars. It's done a couple uh, trajectory uh, correction maneuvers and they're right on target uh, so far. So, uh, so far so good. So here's the illustration. Uh, I don't know if my mouse shows, uh, it looks like my mouse does show on the screen here, but you know, when uh, in July of last year, oops, sorry, July of last year, I think it's waiting, there we go. Uh, Mars was uh, closest. So they launch, uh, it's like, uh, you know, running around the, uh, a racetrack where somebody's on the outer lane and you're on the inner lane, um, you know, trying to catch up. Uh, so you, you shoot where Mars is going to be in the future. Uh, so you're, you're basically, uh, you know, Mars and Earth are both traveling around the sun in the same direction. Um, but uh, in this scenario, uh, uh, yeah, the Perseverance launch has a couple of these uh, course maneuvers uh, along the way, but it, you're, you're trying to catch up to it on the track, so to speak. Um, so that's a seven month journey right there. Uh, orbital mechanics is a complex thing. I don't, uh, I'm just an armchair uh, enthusiast for these kinds of things. So. Uh, but it, it's uh, really crazy that they can uh, uh, hit these things with such level of precision. Uh, and, and it's, it's like a, an awesome quarterback who know, knows where his uh, receivers are going to be before they're even there, and you can uh, aim right at them uh, in the future. So, uh, you know, starting off from, you know, this is built all, mostly at JPL. Um, you know, one of the first questions I get talking about the Mars rovers is how big is it? Well, you can see for reference point here, it's about the size of an SUV. You can see the engineers and scientists standing up along it. Um, it was uh, you know, built there and they got the, uh, the crane, the, the rocket crane, uh, so to speak, uh, down to the bottom right here. So all the major components were built at JPL, uh, of course, on the technologies that successfully delivered Curiosity to the Mars surface in 2012. Uh, Mars, the, uh, it has a nearly identical rover at JPL in California. Um, it's a vehicle system test bed and its name is Optimism. So the, the one on Earth that remains here is Optimism. The one that's going to Mars is Perseverance. And it's a full scale engineering version of the, the Mars bound rover. Uh, so they're able to test things with this, uh, uh send commands to this and, uh, really, uh, if they have to encounter new situations along the way, they can fully replicate these scenarios on Earth uh, uh, in advance before they send commands to space. If they have a particular tricky situation they get stuck in, um, they're not totally uh, uh, left uh, to just communicate with uh, Mars. So this full scale test bed is pretty cool. Uh, right now, there's uh, five pieces of the uh, the what's currently cruising to Mars. Obviously the rocket that got it to space isn't shown here, but the cruise stage, there's a back shell, the descent, descent stage, the Perseverance rover itself and a heat shield. Uh, the cruise stage is going to eject uh, fairly soon. I forget it, that, 
uh, actually detaches prior to uh, them getting close to reentry. And the back shell down to the heat shield are the, that's really uh, the, the clam shell uh, that contains all of those. So uh, what does it look like though? Because um, you know, each one, uh, this thing is loaded with more cameras than we had before. Um, last time, uh, when Curiosity was delivered, you know, there were cameras, and, and actually the descent was captured from one of the orbiting uh, Mars uh, satellites uh, that uh, takes photos of uh, all of Mars and, and maps it. They caught it under parachute. Um, this has parachute lookup cameras, look down cameras uh, for landing. So it, it's really loaded and even has microphones on here. So they're going to be able to capture audio. Uh, of this at a certain point too, should it successfully land. So we're going to have a lot more visual, uh, higher quality images, and even some audio uh, at a certain point, which is pretty amazing uh, to hear sounds from another planet. Just uh, as a quick question, I remember the, sure. the last time we sent some uh, rovers over, we actually sent a couple of CubeSats over to watch the descent from orbit. Did we do that with this rover this time? I don't recall off the top of my head. I'd have to look that up. I do remember there were a couple of CubeSats. Uh, that was a test bed for, I think, some future missions, but I don't recall um, if they had a role in this or not. Sorry, I can't answer that one without looking it up later. Okay, That's thanks. Just, it, it popped into my mind. Yeah, but they, they have tested CubeSats as a, as a you know, way to relay communications uh, in a much cheaper way. Uh, and after their use, uh, they, they kind of just keep uh, trucking on to wherever they're headed or, or potentially crash in the future. But the uh, uh, the entry, descent, and landing phase is a incredibly complex phase to get this lander down to safely down to the surface of Mars. Uh, it starts at the cruise, okay, here it is. The cruise stage separation is about 10 minutes prior to landing. So that, uh, that, uh, that top piece I was talking about early comes off about 10 minutes prior to landing and then uh, uh, goes off in a different direction. But the rest of uh, this from the atmospheric entry all the way down to landing is about uh, seven minutes. And uh, JPL called this the seven minutes of terror because this is an entirely automated uh, process at this point. And it takes, uh, it takes about 11 to 13 minutes, I think, for signals to get back to Earth from how this all went. So there's a period of darkness where we don't know if it succeeded or not until the proper uh, uh, signal was just sent back that landing was accomplished. So all the phases in here are autonomously uh, created and, and managed from uh, uh, its steering early end to the guided entry to the parachute deployment. Uh, yeah, these steps are uh, uh, incredibly complex. I mean, it's entering uh, the atmosphere, um, yeah, and it's about 2,370 degrees Fahrenheit uh, at its peak uh, heating, the parachute deploys at about 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, no, the heat shield slows it to about 1,000 miles an hour. And then the parachute deploys uh, about seven miles up from the surface at a velocity of about 940 miles an hour. So these are supersonic parachutes. Now, the atmosphere of Mars is only about 1% of that of Earth's even uh, at the surface. So we're dealing with um, much different aerodynamics uh, than we'd experience here on Earth and also different gravity. Uh, so uh, this is going to be a much more precise landing uh, zone than Curiosity had. They're going to have some uh, new technologies on here which are really referencing uh, ground imagery based on what they've captured from satellites to really steer it more precisely to their intended target zone. So they have to do less driving with a uh, rover uh, to get to where they want after. Uh, they're trying to hit the, the target much more spot on. And I've got a graphic in a minute, which will show how much uh, that, that focus area. So uh, from the terrain, and when the heat shield comes off, it's using radar and uh, uh, cameras to really look and map out in real time very quickly where it thinks it's headed. So uh, it can even um, uh, know when to detach the parachute uh, and then the the really thrilling part is when this power descent happens from the sky crane uh, and uh, uh, it also has its own radar uh, and at a certain point it uh, gets just down close enough uh, to uh, uh, let the rover down on cables detach those and then the sky crane literally just detaches flies away and crashes uh, it 
main purpose at that point is just to get far enough away and out of the way of, of the mission so it, it doesn't interfere with anything. So all in all, from 10 minutes to the end here landing, it's, uh, it's thrilling. And uh, uh, I have links at the end to where you can watch this uh, live at JPL on the 18th uh, and wait for that confirmation of touchdown. So if, if you had seen that for curiosity or saw the videos, that's pretty thrilling. And, and for anybody who's you know, that excited, it almost brings a tear to your eye, I think, um, you know, for something that succeeds like that. So the new landing technique, again, it takes descent photos and compares it to an orbital map that was pre-planned and can divert itself with a sky crane as necessary. So we're not hitting rough terrain. It needs a nice landing zone. Uh, the rover will drive to some areas that are quite hilly, but uh, it needs a safe spot for landing. So it's landing in a spot named Jezero Crater uh, and the Perseverance landing site target is about five miles by about four miles uh, as an ellipse. Uh, so it's expected to land in this area. Uh, and if you can already start looking at this, this much looks like a, a river delta that you'd see on Earth, and that's the purpose. Uh, this used to be an ancient lake, uh, and uh, this area is uh, where they, you know, this river delta can harbor signs of fossilized microbial life. Um, it's, they have the best chance, and they, a lot of research, you know, chose this as the target area uh, near the crater rim. So we're talking about the edges of the lake uh, where there's a lot of layers of sediment and other potential things uh, to look through in rock layers. So much like a ge ge geographical map here, uh, this area has a bunch of different potential surface types within the range of the mission uh, for surface operations. And uh, it's going to be able to collect samples and store these samples uh, and leave them at almost as geocaches <laughs> for anybody who likes geocaching for future missions to find and locate. Uh, they'll be precisely marked and identified uh, with their coordinates for future missions, maybe robotic, maybe human, uh, to uh, pick up and return to Earth for further study. So I don't know. I think that animations coming up a little bit on here. So the depot uh, caching strategy, there's a primary mission from the red X up to the first blue dots where it's gonna leave some of its first samples. And then the extended mission will uh, go up to different parts of the edge of this crater to collect different types of samples from different areas and return the samples all to uh, caching sites that are gonna be recorded uh, and potentially uh, found in future. Um, I had the chance to ask, uh, uh, through our solar system ambassador channel on, a, on a, a conference call with NASA, you know, what would happen, you know, there, there's some wind on Mars, you know, they're trying to pick locations where the wind isn't going to cover up uh, these samples with Martian dust and, and regolith. So that is a concern, but they're going to try to choose these caching, these drop off locations very well, uh, so that there's a high chance even years from now, uh, they'll still be found or maybe just if they're very uh, not far below the surface if they do happen to get covered up. So they've put a lot of thought into choosing the right location to drop those off where uh, the lower wind pressure isn't gonna mess it up either. So the surface operations are to really, this is a geologist dream, uh, to find compelling rocks, collect those samples, seal them in the advanced uh, collection tubes that they've built uh, that are carried aboard Perseverance, carry those samples on the rover in a protected area until they can find those spots to cache them properly uh, and, and secure uh, their locations for future recovery. And you know, there's a yet to be determined future Mars mission to pick these up. I don't even know if it's been budgeted for or approved, but the plan is uh, you, you plan for them to be picked up someday and, uh, and hope uh, there can be a mission approved to get that. So when is the question? We have no idea. So the Mars uh, Perseverance rover is nearly identical to the Curiosity rover. It's about five inches longer than Curiosity and it's heavier uh, by a couple hundred pounds. It's uh, on Earth weight, it's about 2,259 pounds compared to Curiosity's 1,981 pounds. Uh, and of course, uh, Mars gravity is less than uh, Earth. So, um, uh, you know, they they've, have to build everything accordingly. It, it doesn't weigh as much there, but still uh, it, it's got to roll over lots of heavy duty terrain. So the main uh, differences, uh, visually it looks very much the same. 
But from the back to the, you know, the left to the front, the, one of the biggest, most important differences, I think, for uh, long-term duration here is the wheels. The wheels are, um, here, I'll get that on the next slide in a second. I'll talk about the wheels, but the, the new dimensions, they're, they're thicker, they're, uh, they're a thinner profile, they have more treads and they're thicker metal. The, the ones on Curiosity have been punctured, if you've seen the photos, but they've been punctured by a lot of sharp rocks. Uh, even after trying to avoid them uh, in some of the autonomous driving. Uh, there's a cross beam uh, in the back to stabilize the rover more do during launch. Um, it's got an onboard caching system to collect these uh, 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 cores that are drilled by the robotic arm. And the turret is a lot heavier as well. And there's a ton more cameras. There's 23 cameras now, most in color. Uh, they're hazard avoidance cameras for driving. Uh, as well as the mast cam, you know, which looks like the head on the rover. You know, it's the, <laughs> we, get, we see, you know, the eye and the, the, the mast there uh, that takes the high definition uh, video or actually photos uh, that are stitched together in, in different kinds of uh, panoramics and close-ups of uh, the samples they're uh, collecting. There are seven major uh, instruments uh, across the, uh, the Perseverance rover. Uh, it's on the back on the left, we've got RIMFAX, that subsurface radar, and I'll go to the next slides, we'll talk about little of these at a, a very high level. The mass cam, which is the zoomable panoramic cameras. Uh, there are actually two cameras underneath the white box that those arrows are pointing to. They've got the super cam, and that's a laser micro imager. That's aiming down often at the science spot that's in front of the rover where the uh, uh, drill is doing its work, um, so it can uh, basically zap rocks with lasers. Uh, you know, everybody's toy needs a good laser on it. <laughs> I'm sure you've got some good lasers on some of your telescopes too for pointing. Um, there's a weather station on the rover. Um, this is going to bring a lot of, uh, you know, again, trying to learn for future missions and wind speeds. Uh, really, just getting more sense for uh, for that. So uh, that's going to be a fun one for local meteorologists to relate to. Maybe that's a good thing you can tie into uh, with local meteorologists and local local TV stations. Uh, and the uh, arm that extends out towards the front has several joints on it, uh, and it's heavier because it has more tools. Uh, this is a rotating tool. It's got cameras on it also and drilling tools. Uh, it's got a bunch of stuff all packed into there, as well as an X-ray spectrometer. Um, so uh, that's where all the busy work is done with the, uh, the tools at the end of that arm. Uh, and the wheels are bigger and narrower with thicker skin. So it's meant to be a, a lot more durable. So real quick, I'm not gonna read through all this detail, but the mass cam uh, is, you know, the, the, that goes straight up from the rover. It looks like the head of the rover. Uh, yeah, a bunch of different imaging capabilities with the ability to zoom. And uh, it, it does more than just take nice pictures to send back to Earth. There was really is a lot of science with it. The nice benefit is we can see almost when they start sending down data, about 15 minutes later, you can get to raw images. And I'll show you how to get those later. Uh, the uh, you know, different sensors that are gonna provide measurements. This is the, the MEDA is the, basically the weather station, wind speed, pressure, relative humidity, dust size and shape. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of interesting stuff they learned from here. MOXIE, this is a, uh, an exploration technology uh, project that will produce oxygen from the atmospheric carbon dioxide. So this is one of the things they're using to figure out and prepare for future uh, human missions on Mars is how do we make oxygen out of the mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere? So this is really just a test bed uh, to see if that can work and be proven. Um, there's a ton of carbon dioxide there. Can we make oxygen efficiently enough from it? Um, they've got X-ray spectrometers um, that are going to analyze the core samples and other uh, drilling holes uh, that they're doing. Um, they can. Uh, there's a fantastic amount of stuff. It's like a geologist dream tool uh, if you couldn't be there yourself. There's a radar imager for subsurface uh, ground penetrating radar uh, to really look at what's underneath and, and the, the surface right below uh, the rover itself. I don't know how far down it goes, but that's. Uh, you know, versus just the visual surface, uh, there's more to be learned what's uh, straight below. And then uh, the Sherlock spectrometer is another one uh, that's going to, I think that's on the end of the uh, uh, the rover's arm. 
to really look at uh, rocks and other things up close with cameras and uh, and looking for uh, luminescence. Uh, if there are organics and other chemicals, you know, uh, present, uh, it has the, the right set of tools to be able to uh, analyze and detect those with a high degree of uh, certainty. And then last, the SuperCam. This is really the, uh, uh, this is where there's a, a cool laser in it for, you know, really uh, burning up a little bit of rock too. Uh, imaging, chemical composition analysis, and mineralogy. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools here looking for organic compounds, uh, which it's its mission. If there was once water there, you know, again, we've, uh, knowing the same kind of exploration here on Earth, uh, these tools provide uh, the basics for detecting uh, past life, even if it's uh, fossilized in rock. So the, uh, the Perseverance rover, it's got 23 cameras. We are going to have some fantastic views, and I cannot wait. Um, if you haven't, uh, has anyone played around with uh, finding the raw imagery from the Curiosity rover and just seeing the new downloads that come down from that? I played with the Juno cam before. It, it's it's roughly the same thing, I think. Okay, yeah, it, it's uh, you know NASA provides some really cool access to the raw imagery, and uh, they don't um, uh, filter it first. I mean, the raw imagery comes down and it's available to everyone, so uh, it'll be accessible through the Mars 2020 site. Uh, from any of these cameras, uh, the Mars, uh, the, the has cams, which are the front and rear, uh, those are the cameras needed for the autonomous driving, uh, and all the different nav cams up top, as well as, you know, the different panoramic images. So I've done, you know, I had some fun stitching together some of the raw images myself to get a nice panoramic uh, landscape. Just really fascinating that you can get some high def views of another planet, uh, not too long after they're beamed down to Earth. So that's, uh, that's a real fun project. The raw image pipeline uh, will be available through the Mars 2020 website, and the link is up here. These are samples of the raw images that come down from uh, the Curiosity rover. So it's not uh, that they have images every day, uh, but when they do, they do some uh, often come down in bursts. And you can see, you know, the black and white ones here are some of the uh, nav cams, and the higher color ones are from the uh, the better quality cameras. Uh, and this destination, we'll, we'll have one for the Perseverance rover on the site, uh, too, after it lands. And who's heard about the new uh, drone helicopter attached to the Perseverance rover? This is pretty cool. Any of you guys own drones? <laughs> well, uh, uh, it, they're hard enough to fly here on Earth. And when I can see them, and there's real-time response. So uh, this... Uh, this is a technology demonstration. It really has no purpose in any of the science mission. It's just seeing, can we get one of these to fly? So there's been a, a ton of testing with this in a near vacuum chamber because the atmosphere on Mars is only 1% as thick as Earth. There's not a lot of air. So these propellers have to spin at incredible RPMs uh, and it has to be very lightweight to get lift. Uh, so um, this, uh, the whole thing, it's actually gonna be carried on the underbelly of the rover in a protective uh, case that's not shown in this picture. Uh, it's going, after the rover lands, this case is going to detach uh, at some point uh, after the landing, and not immediately, but uh, it will, uh, the case will come off in some fashion. The rover will probably drive forward uh, a bit and the, uh, uh, the drone uh, helicopter called Ingenuity if everything's got a name now, uh, will unfold and uh, be lowered down to the surface. The rover will then drive away the other direction so uh, far enough that it has a clear uh, space. This thing only weighs four pounds and I think that's earth weight. So it's gonna be even lighter there. Uh, it's solar powered and recharges on its own. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the lead uh, technician or the lead scientist on this particular piece uh, told us that they're planning for three different 90-second uh, flights with this uh, to see. And it's got some cameras on it. It's going to be fully autonomous. So they're going to uh, launch this. Uh, and yeah, it takes too long for the signals to uh, be live uh, controlled from Earth. So they have to, uh, it's going to uh, you know, use terrain mapping and or try its test flights and, and know where to go itself. Uh, based on their pre-programmed uh, uh, mission path. So 2,400 RPM blades, uh, computers, uh, navigation sensors, and two cameras, one color, one black and white. 
Uh, the, the rotors are about four feet long and it's about 19 inches tall. So it, it's a pretty big uh, drone, uh, but this is gonna be a pretty fascinating uh, proof of concept if they can get a drone to fly on Mars because uh, it will certainly have future applications um, for future missions because you can get a drone uh, to reach much further than the, the rover can drive. The rover does not drive very fast. We're talking like uh, at top speed, it might be like a, a mile, <laughs> two miles an hour, and it doesn't do that for very uh, long distances. So which of you got the chance to get your names onto the rover uh, that submitted your name? Anybody get that chance? Uh, I think the cutoff was maybe uh, March of 2020, um, but there are three microchips uh, on here. Uh, this is actually uh, about 11 million names are uh, on these uh, three chips that are underneath that protective the surface. They were individually stenciled each name onto the chips by an electron beam. So it's not like your name was on a Sharpie on the side of the marker, <laughs> on the side of the rover, uh, but it's uh, pretty cool that, uh, you know, this is, NASA often has uh, send your name along on, on missions. And there's uh, a chance to get your name on future Mars missions as well, uh, still if you sign up online, and I've got a link on that here. So um, yeah, those are here. So they, this is a little placard that's on that uh, stability control uh, just above the power source, which is a... Uh, uh, a basically a nuclear battery. Uh, I don't, I'm not an expert on that part, but uh, uh, radioactive decay powers the uh, rover and creates electricity uh, and heat. So uh, if you did, uh, you know, NASA is doing this a bit more often for big missions, you can actually make your own boarding passes and, and put your name on these chips that are sent on a multiple missions. Geez, by this point, I think I'm on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, I'm on the InSight Lander, that's already on Mars. I've been on uh, several other missions. Uh, so it's just a fun participation thing actually, and it's good if, for outreach. If I can just join in, they, sure. NASA actually gives out uh, frequent flyer miles for that too. So you, you, <laughs> you can check your points values and you want, and by the way, I've, I've found mine, I've got sitting right here, so. That's cool. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's great for outreach. Uh, it, it's really fun. And uh, you can sign up the next mission to Mars. They don't know what it is yet, but you can sign up and uh, you have this link below. Uh, if you just search for send your name to Mars, NASA, uh, you can find the link as well and kind of reserve that and print out your boarding pass now. Something else cool. So on this, the rear stability arm for the rover, um, this graphic is um, Morse code uh, spelled out here in an interesting way, um, kind of a, a try to attempt at universal. So all the dots and dashes uh, along the um, uh, the image here, uh, it explores one. So they they try to put a lot of symbolic uh, imagery on here that gives it some uh, interest for us all sending something to Earth. I guess uh, in the case that uh, someone else discovers one of these one day. Perseverance has its own nameplate on the uh, the arm out front. Um, there's a really cool interactive 3D model online where you can really zoom in and, and check out all the different parts and features and learn more about it. Uh, you can uh, activate parts, extend the, uh, the drilling arm. Uh, it's a really fun um, uh, thing if you're interested. Uh, they even have uh, some even, I think NASA even published, uh, if anybody's in a 3D printer space, they published all the 3D print files to make your own rover. It's quite complex. I, I don't have my, my own 3D printer, but I actually checked uh, with a local 3D print vendor how much it would cost to make it, and I uh, I, I couldn't afford it. It's one of those things. If you have to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> I think they say it takes about two thousand dollars to print it all out and put it all together. Yeah, I, I had some quick sticker shock. I thought I'd have a cool tool for outreach when I actually got back to seeing people again, and no, <laughs> I can't afford that. I need to make a million too. <laughs> And, uh, you know, landing day, Thursday, February 18, not Monday, uh, it will start at about 11.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, 2.30 Eastern, and uh, landing confirmation will be around 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern. So uh, there will be a lot of news and uh, stuff leading up to that, mostly commentary, but the key time is, uh, you know, uh, hopefully there's an excited room of uh, folks at GPL uh, around 4 o'clock Eastern. Uh, three o'clock your time, I believe, then uh, the first images from the surface will hopefully be shown at around that time. But you can watch live at all these links. 
uh, share these as well. I'm going to make a, uh, I'm not live streaming anything myself, but I'm going to create a Facebook event and provide links to all this for my followers and really start promoting this stuff heavy because uh, it, Curiosity's landing in 2012 got a lot of excitement in advance of the landing, really got people focused on Mars and, and NASA missions and all the people that made these things possible. So it's, uh, it's going to be quite exciting, I think. And after landing, you know, it's got the primary mission is a, a one year goal, but they've got a quite aggressive plan. If it's, uh, you know, this is Curiosity's location and, and map. And if uh, anything uh, goes as well as Curiosity, uh, Perseverance could be living for quite you know, a decade as well on the surface of Mars and, and doing quite a bit of science. So it can be tracked, you know, per current uh, location and, uh, and future plans where it's going to so you can follow along and, uh, and you know, get a sense for where the, you know, the raw images that are coming down are, are coming from on, on Mars near this uh, crater. So it's, uh, you know, before, during, and after, there's plenty of stuff to keep interested here on. And uh, yeah, nothing blows me away more than getting a, a fantastic uh, panoramic view of another planet in high def from 15 minutes ago. <laughs> That's a pretty exciting thing. So I believe this is the last slide I have. Uh, no, this is the last one. And then uh, you can get a virtual uh, uh, kind of, you know, a way to incorporate the different camera views uh, into where its current lo model location is using an, uh, an artist's you know, 3D uh, a fake picture model, but superimposed on the area it's actually traveling in and what the, the local photos look like. So they're really providing lots of tools for people to explore this quite easily without much uh, technology. You can do it all through a web browser. So that is the end of my slide. I'm gonna switch back here to the screen And I believe I have that off and back here. So uh, hopefully that's a broad overview and about the time frame we've set here to, to chat about stuff. I'd be happy to ask uh, any questions and uh, uh, answer any questions that you may have. And uh, we'll talk about what you're most interested in about in the, uh, the upcoming mission. So fire away. Yeah, Marty, I'm I'm pleased to see they they address the wheels. I'm I'm curious to see how that pans out. Yeah. Um, the other big problem was the dust. I mean, you, you pointed it out for the uh, the caching. They took that into consideration. Hopefully, that doesn't gum up the works for this one. Yeah, that was one of my questions. After I learned about the caching, we were on a conference call with JPL and uh, you know had the chance to learn about that. I, I kind of sheepishly asked the question because I'm certain I wasn't the first one to think about it. And of course, they had an answer. They think of everything 15 times over. Is you know we see these sand dunes and dust you know accumulating like a, a sand dune here on Earth. And God, what if the, one of these things gets covered up? Well, they're going to be precisely pinpointing their location to within in, within inches. Uh, so even if it is slightly or fully covered, they still they still may have a good chance of finding it. But choosing the right location that's on the top of a, a who knows uh, where there's not a lot of sand accumulating is the goal. And it's really great news about the rover wheels because you see those now and you just wonder, oh my gosh, how long can those last? And won't that suck the day one of those uh, wheels, you know, fully is disabled and it get, has to get dragged along. And they've kind of figured out they could probably drag two or three wheels along until it's fully uh, stuck. Hmm. If the wheels don't rotate, they can still rotate, but you know, those holes are only getting bigger in Curiosity's wheels. So they're having to be safer too about where they drive it from now on. Yeah, I, I think what uh, I'm probably most excited about, only because Curiosity has set the standard now, I think, right, for what we expect. Um, it'll, be the, it'll, it'll be that, that selfie, you know? It'll be the full panoramic selfie uh, that they stitched together. I think that's, I mean, sure, there's, there's all the research. I'm, I'm hopeful that everything will go off without a hitch. You know, it just yeah. doesn't crater, and that's, well, oh, well, you know. There's more things that have crashed on other planets than landed. <laughs> so uh, it, it would be a, a disappointing, uh, expensive uh, crash landing. Um, and uh, I know there'd be a lot of people would be upset, but uh, you know, they're going on a proven technology once, at least that's worked well once. 
uh, without a hitch. It works so well, they're hoping to repeat that. So uh, and, everybody's crossing their fingers. And NASA also has an exceptional track record when it comes to rovers. They're uh, batting 100 so far. <laughs> oh, I should point out that uh, Amy is our, our local solar system ambassador. So that oh, your wonderful. colleague. Hi, Amy. Hello. And uh, she Great had made mention of that at the, the, the start and the, in the chat, and I just never mentioned it. Oh, great. Until now. I have a yeah, question. It, it's a, what? Yeah, hopefully their 100% uh, their track run keeps up. <laughs> what are the actual computed odds of success for this mission? Boy, I don't know that. Uh, I haven't Most seen the time they published or discussed. Up. It's curious. I'm sure somebody's got the odds. I'm certain of it. I don't know what they are. Uh, I don't know that that's ever put out in a press release. So, uh, Interesting. boy, I'd I'm say not even sure better. I have the the, ask. What do you think, Amy? <laughs> I think they're better than Curiosity's because Curiosity was using a new landing system that had all of JPL holding their breath. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, that, I'd, I'd be really curious about the odds. Uh, Tell you what, after they land, I'll ask JPL, and maybe Amy, you can reach out to them as well to see what do you think the odds were? Uh, what were your odds? We'll ask them if it goes well, what the odds <laughs> were. <laughs> Otherwise, hey, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, I just. That guy. <laughs> Amy, I don't know if you remember or not, but uh, about a year or two after Curiosity landed, we had an engineer who was in the landing group at JPL came and talked to us. And he said it truly was seven minutes of terror because they did not know if it would work or not. Never done done before. The, the one that thing that always stuck in my mind on it was that he brought a few little props with him. And he said, do you know what we used to hold the parachute to the crane? And we said, no, what was it? He held up a chunk of quarter inch nylon rope. And he said, we bought it at Home Depot. That's what was used to hold the parachute to the crane on for curiosity. <laughs> that just blows my mind every time I think about it. Hey, tax dollars, it works in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that yeah. nylon cord is great stuff. I've got a, a small reel of it in the, that I keep for my utility closet. Too. Let's not forget duct tape. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, uh, the government but, duct tape, I'm sure, costs a little more than our Home Depot. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, to be fair, people would pay more for br NASA branded duct tape anyway. Um, just, just I, I maybe, trust their duct tape more than mine. Maybe they can use it for fundraising. <laughs> yeah, just in the gift shop at the various facilities throughout the country. Buy the tape that has saved Apollo thirteen. Yeah, that would sell. Yep. It, it, it's, uh... Any other questions or things you're looking forward to? Anybody yeah. check out the imagery from Curiosity? I oh, do. Ahead, you had a question? Uh, are any other nations planning Mars rovers other than us at the present time? Um, ESA. Know, uh, ESA. Well, at is. present, uh, during this launch window, I think we're the only ones launching a rover onto the surface. But there are a couple of other countries that are putting things in orbit around Mars. China. I that, including China and the United Arab Well, Emirates, China is um, T. Um, Tian when one is a lander orbiter rover combo and okay. it's their first time attempting to go to Mars and ESA and Roscosmos I can never pronounce the Roscosmos lander but the ESA, ESA was going to have a rover called Rosalind but they delayed it because they were having parachute test problems okay and there are many components on the Perseverance rover that have come from other countries. Uh, other countries have, have contributed uh, different uh, uh, science pieces and mechanics uh, to different uh, things. So it, it is a uh, mostly a NASA JPL effort, but uh, certainly other countries have participated in many ways on the rover as well. And in answer to the um, um, Rabbi, question, I know that ESA is going to be our primary partner in getting the samples back. It's, oh, supposed okay. to be a, it's supposed to be a tag team where they do a little rover that goes and gathers them and puts them in a launch vehicle. And then it goes, is going to launch and get snagged by another one in orbit and come back. 
but they don't have the time. Yeah. But they don't have the timeline hammered out yet because once you get it launched, you've got to catch it pretty quick. Otherwise, it'll ca re come back to Mars in not a good way. <laughs> and Amy, I heard if they find aliens on Mars, uh, us ambassadors are actually our, our side job description is they push us out first to go meet them. <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not we want to, I think that was in the fine print of the contract we signed. <laughs> Uh-oh, that's what I get for not reading it. <laughs> well, that'll teach you something. But hey, free trip out of off of off world, um, which gosh, that sounds exciting. Um, that that can be envious of that. Uh, I'll have to I've got another friend that's a solar system ambassador over in Atlanta. I'll have to let him know. Um, but. Well, I've got a Any question about the uh, yeah, I've got a question about the ground penetrating radar. Uh, do you have any specs on it? Uh, I don't. I, uh, how I, deep I, I can it go, for stuff. example? I don't know them uh, more off the top of my head. Um, I think, uh, let me see if I can find here real quick. <laughs> Instruments, uh, ground penetrating radar. Yeah, it'd be interesting to so see what that's a, the radar imager. Um, yeah, here we go. So a little bit about it. Um, it's about a seven pound instrument that has about five to 10 watts of power. Um, and it says data return. Well, I don't know if you're looking for things, there's a frequency range of 150 to 1200 megahertz on this. Mm -hmm. The vertical resolution will be as small as about three to 12 inches thick, as small as. Penetration depth will be greater than 30 feet. Wow. Depending on the materials it's going for. Jeez. So that's pretty, I, until I looked this up, I didn't uh, actually get to that level of yeah. detail. So that's pretty impressive. That is. And that measurable measurement interval will be about every four inches along the rover track. So whenever mm -hmm. they turn this on, they're going to better pretty cool <laughs> depth uh, map. I can't wait to see some of the graphics on that so they can see uh, what are the different layers straight down. Right. right. And given that this was an old river delta, um, there's bound to be some really interesting layers as they go along, you know, closer up to the rim, things will deepen or uh, get more shallow, uh, depending on where they're driving. So um, one of the quotes here from the principal, the principal investigator is that no one wrote, uh, then Eric Homron, the principal investigator for this, uh, the radar says, no one knows what lies beneath the surface of Mars. Now we'll be, finally be able to see what's there. Yeah. And of, of course we know the, uh, the InSight lander is trying to drill with its mole, but getting stuck trying to get under the surface to uh, take temperature readings. Um, they're having difficulty um, uh, drilling down into with that uh, device they have that's supposed to go down, I think up to 12 feet. They, they're having mm -hmm. trouble with uh, it getting any traction and they're trying to push it with the uh, one of the uh, little uh, arms it's got to uh, uh, pick up uh, samples. So um, there's a lot to learn down. Um, you know, what's down below is probably more interesting than maybe what's on the surface because it's, uh, uh, yeah, there, there's been so much erosion on the surface. So a lot to learn. That, uh, 30 feet down for the radar, that's pretty cool. Well, also, the, the Mars has less of a magnetosphere, so there's going to be more radiation. So it, it's kind of like the moon. It's getting blanched by the sunlight. So yeah. below the surface of Mars is where all the exciting things are, if there are any exciting things that are you know, not things on Mars. Um, right. So that'll, that'll be really cool. Yeah. I think a few years ago, one of the orbiters found a br briny pool underneath the South Pole, if I'm recalling correctly. Yeah, with the ice caps that you've probably all had a chance to see through your own scopes uh, this past summer, uh, you know, <laughs> that's pretty cool. It, I, I imagine, I wonder when, I don't know when that might be an area of exploration because, you know, that trapped water ice or carbon dioxide uh, ice, whatever it may be, form it may be in, um, that's bound to have some stuff as well. So uh, I, I wonder if that is a ideal uh, mission spot in the future or not. I haven't heard Gosh, yeah, I, I think about the the added difficulty of landing something on the pole versus landing it. <laughs> it so I, I have no idea what the the the, the dynamics there are. Yeah, um, but right. yeah, it, it seems like that if nobody's going to the polar regions, there must be a reason for it. It's like you go for the right. easy shots first. Well, the reason actually is is 
because of the thinness of Mars's atmosphere, they haven't perfected technologies to land at higher altitudes. There hasn't been a successful landing um, higher than a kilometer below, quote, sea level on Mars. Ah, okay. So, actually wow. found a J, uh, an article that went into this and That's there cool. are because I've been wondering why aren't don't they haven't they tried landing in Helios Planeta or on Olympus Mons because those seem like yeah. prime science candidates <laughs> that is super curious and maybe if, if we're getting these uh, the little uh, sky cranes really really well done that'll help us land into thinner atmosphere parts of Mars too and yeah. uh, well wherever else we decide to go. I, I'm not sure that we'd have trouble with a, a thin atmosphere on, on Venus, but uh, well, I don't know if we can even land on Mercury or what the atmosphere there looks like. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just hot soup on Venus. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just that, that's that. I think that the latest plans to send things to Venus is to not land, uh, to actually send it <laughs> into the clouds at this point. I actually yeah, saw a plan for a rover that's going to not have any electrical parts. It's going to be mechanical. And it's going to be like driven. It's going to be like a little sail powered rover. What, a, a steampunk rover? <laughs> Effectively, and they're working on the the sciences to get the materials to withstand the temperatures. Like their battery tech, they're working on an alternative that can handle the temperatures where everything will be fine and work optimally at those hellish temperatures. Oh, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. Amazing. Yeah. That, that, that's the, that, gosh, the, the ingenuity of some of these engineers. It it's always starts off as a pipe dream and somehow they make it happen. Well, they make the things that can happen, happen. Um, I so think it's really one of the that. candidates for one of the current projects. I, is it the Discovery Program? I think it may be one of the Discovery know. Program ones. Hmm. Fascinating, though, just what they're able to think of and what the, the obstacles yep. they have to overcome just, just on the own planets in our own solar <laughs> system. It, it just goes to show you exactly what uh, why rocket scientists has become slang common slang for brilliant person. Um, just <laughs> <laughs> um. Any other okay. questions? Are we good? Comments, questions, concerns, criticisms. Is anyone else really, really excited about ingenuity? I am. That that's a that's you know drone flying around. I mean that's relevant to kids these days. You have drones in their own backyard, uh, and watching that succeed on another planet. Hopefully it works. Uh, if it doesn't, they have got some learning to do with it. But uh, that's, that's well, really cool. To be fair, my first drone didn't work either. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I have more the equivalent of an FAA license on uh, Mars. I don't know. <laughs> well, that. Actually, I don't think there is any regulating body for anything more than about 100 miles up at this point. So I, I think there could. Um, it's, it's, but we're game. more or less, we've been complaining for, for several months now about all the, uh, the, the constellation satellites and how there is no regulating authority um, yeah. off of the Earth to, to stop them. So yeah, this is, until it's a problem, it's, it's not a problem. Um, that they're not going to hit anything. There's, it's hope, unless we get really lucky, it'll be the only thing in the sky in Mars when it, when it gets to, to flying around up there. Yeah. Well, if it does hit anything, that's not necessarily a bad problem to have. No, that'd be really cool. Like if it runs into a Martian bird or something like that, that'd be really cool. <laughs> or, or, or if it get hits, if it gets clipped by a meteorite, I think I'd be pretty, pretty cool with that. Um, Covered in love bugs. Yeah, it just it, it just sort of runs through a little swarm of flies and gets clogged. Yeah, this is the, this the is good science. Aliens run the rover; they can move their green screen fast enough for it. So, uh, but the, <laughs> yeah. the drone might uncover them faster than anything else. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was I was wondering about that with the, uh, the you were talking about the panoramic cameras. Like, well, how are they going to fool the cameras now if it can see in three sixty degrees? And so, <laughs> they're not going to be able to get around it to mess with it. Take the little selfies with the bunny ears behind it and all. Yeah. Um, 
So the, a whole cottage industry of cartoonists that happened after the last rubber landed will, will be out of work. Um, okay, does anybody have any yeah. further questions yeah. for- uh, The golden arches over the hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's always just one crater over. And uh, unfortunately, when you're moving it only a, what, a, a half a mile an hour it, or a mile or an hour or yeah, so, they, 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 yeah, they can always just outrun it. I'd, I'd love to see the the this rover versus the the, the giant shuttle crawler in a, a land race and see who was able to, to make it a half mile faster. And I'm I, pretty sure it's the shuttle. It crew. might be the shuttle crawler. I think it's the shuttle crawler. Well, let's see. The crawler can go a mile per hour loaded and two miles per hour unloaded. So I don't know. I'm betting on the little guy. <laughs> Well, I mean, to, to be fair, we'd have to put them on the same surface. Like, I'm sure that the Martian rover moves a little faster on Earth, um, or it's got a little more friction. Um, but yeah. I, I couldn't say for sure. Um, we could we could send off a nice inquiry to JPL to find out. Um, and I'm sure they will do the math for us and get us back an answer um, if, uh, if, if we ask. Amy and I can go to about asking that now. Who would win a race, the, the shuttle crawler or the <laughs> Perseverance rover? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can say loaded or unloaded and, and both. Yeah, it's it. So we're gonna have to get really technical. Yeah, Earth gravity, Mars gravity. Yeah, and, and uh, make we'll put it. Actually, that's that's a great question. We'll have it once on Earth and once on Mars and see if there's a difference. Um, yeah. uh, with all the the different complexities of a fully loaded <laughs> Martian, uh, you know, uh, shuttle rover, shuttle crawler. Um, yeah, can you imagine the crane to drop that? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, well, I mean, that, well, the the crane can't factor into the actual race because it's discarded before they they actually get to the surface. Um, I no, no, I mean a crane to drop the shuttle crawler, just a crane to, to drop it there so they could, yeah, so they could do the race. You need about yeah. a thousand uh, Mars cranes. <laughs> yep. Well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I'm trying to imagine this entire drone and exactly how much effort would put into the to testing this theory. Um, yeah. Some some eccentric billionaire if jeff bezos gets his, his system fully operational he, he can check it out for us i'm sure um or or if mr musk tries it I, i'm sure nasa will give it to the in, engineer the interns to figure it out hey practice on this yeah well i mean <laughs> theoretically we could toss it or we could outsource this over to lsu and, and see if some of them have some some great things um and i'm, I'm sure that uh that, that would be a wonderful call for our, our professor friends to wake up to tomorrow morning. And like, what are the people over at the Patterns Astronomical Society smoking now? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we, we've asked them worse questions, I'm sure. <laughs> um, speaking of questions, is if anybody else have some uh, fantastical or otherwise? Any other questions? <laughs> um, Justin says they'll likely give it to a student as a problem on a test. <laughs> cop out well i mean and to be fair if you have to make them figure out the specs itself by giving the horsepower of the engine and everything like that and the weights and etc cetera, etc cetera. like that make them figure it out the same way they figured it out then it becomes an interesting math problem um but uh if you're just given numbers and like okay great i can do that um all right uh do we have any further questions for our our guest and uh, our wonderful, well-humored individual who is now entertaining fantastical questions um, <laughs> that, that are just mo mostly for our amusement. Um, Here's another interesting one. How many sky cranes would it take? <laughs> to, to, to land a, 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 a shuttle <laughs> crawler. <laughs> crawler. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to have an entire list to, to send over to the people at JPL for them to, to wake up to tomorrow morning. And, uh, well, if and you had to scale up a uh, sky crane, how big would it have to be to drop the Mars <laughs> the shuttle? And then uh, <laughs> what size rocket would you need to launch all <laughs> said thing in the first place <laughs> to put it into orbit around Mars? I or don't... would it be more economical to, to use the new lunar gateway to build this rocket and fire it <laughs> off from the moon? Um, and uh, the, yeah. There are plenty of wonderful questions. Should we mine the materials to build the rocket from the moon in order to launch <laughs> the crawler sky crane and crawler? Um, so as we can we can make this as complicated as we want. Yeah, this yeah. Is, this is... we can go all night with this one. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> which is well, that, that's the, the the beauty of curiosity is it just has no end um, until you get the answers, in which case, oh well, where's the fun in that? Or until its wheels fall apart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so we we seem to be asking more and more of the same questions at this point. Uh, do we have any other technical questions that uh, are not uh, purely for our own amusement uh, to ask Mr. McGuire? Um, well, I I mentioned to him prior to this that uh, if we didn't have a lot of questions, one subject uh, I'd like him to speak on is just interacting as a media personality because um, earlier this year we had we were fortunate to have Steve Caparata give a talk to the club, and um, I know a that, local weatherman. And I know Marty that you know he he reaches out to the meteorologists, and that's who you know takes most of the interest uh, in our hobby and having someone come speak. I know Greg Andrews that gave this the the talk at the beginning of the year up in Shreveport, he goes on KTBS channel three all the time and, and does spots. So, uh, there's, there's a to handle all of our uh, social media obligations and, uh, to also be able to reach out to the, the local media, newspaper, television, et cetera, et cetera, and, and be our, yeah. our point person. Um, and your local meteorologist. I mean, that's the most science. A lot of people see each day. That's what I, you know, I learned is yeah, the folks that's often the only scientist they encounter in a week or a month is their local meteorologist and the ability to link up uh, things that are very relevant to the average uh, person uh, through TV are, you know, what's up in the night sky. I, I'm starting now a monthly series, which is just a copycat off of JPL's what's up uh, for the coming month. Uh, and feeding that information to my local meteorologist. So, you know, I'm doing a what's up segment with him. Hopefully they continue it, uh, you know, throughout this year. Uh, we just pick, you know, what's the one exciting thing about the night sky and what are two kind of related NASA thing, go, things going on with NASA that are relevant that uh, your neighbor might be, be say, oh, that's cool. Um, somebody who's not a, a, in an astronomy club or society, uh, you know, who's just, uh, that might, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, so, you know, reaching out to them, whether it's a, you know, meteorologist always, they need needing to fill airtime. They're needing to fill, make web articles and, and stuff for content. They need content desperately. So if it's a photo of, you know, a conjunction or uh, a beautiful sunrise or a sunset or, a, you know, a solar image you took um, with sunspots with some of these awesome filters you're all talking about, <laughs> email to find out how to email that to your local news department or meteorologist and get their email address and really say, hey, we're here to help you out with content. I don't make any money. I'm doing this for free for fun <laughs> on my own. So I'm sending my meteorologist a ton of content and he's he's making a portfolio out of it, fine. But I'm getting my outreach through it at the same time and you know, getting a little bit of traffic back towards me and it, it, it's just fun. Um, so they're desperate for content. Your content creators with taking photos to your telescopes and everything that you're looking up at the night sky for. Um, and you know, I've given uh, our meteorologists a timeline of all the major, when are, what are the dates of all the meteor showers in the coming year? What are the dates of the cool conjunctions or when is you know, Jupiter high in the night sky? And you know, just the, the, the things like, Half the people who go out, or probably I'd say 75% of the folks who go out and look at a night sky don't know that they can see planets. Yeah, that those bright things they think are all stars. And then they say, no, that's Jupiter, that's Saturn, that's Mars. Uh, and those are things that just blow people's minds. And if you, you give those content nuggets to uh, your meteorologist or your, your local station, maybe have a couple meteorologists to cover the different ships. If you find a way to talk to all of them, Maybe you'll find one that really has the passion and needs the content. And usually it's the younger guy who's got the worst hours. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you help uh, him get more attention at the station by giving him cool stuff and uh, work with your club. And you know, Amy's there, and, you know, and your, your information officer. Uh, you'll become the hero for your new station uh, if you position yourselves as the local experts to uh, turn to for him. So... That can be a, a fun thing, and I, I've I only have the one success, you know, for my local station. I've not repeated that anywhere else. It's, I've only just started this uh, in the past, probably uh, six months, just starting with sending photos, and it's gradually building. So have fun with it, and just keep up with it. And and they need more help than uh, 
they they admit. <laughs> Well, plus there's only so many times you can tell people, well, there's rain today or it's going to be cold today before yeah. eventually the, the people get mad at you. So if you show them a nice, pretty picture, it, it's on the side. Of, it kind of it's the, the spoonful of sugar, so to speak. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that's a great idea to, to, to just give them good content. And mind you, all the local poli uh, weather stations are actively soliciting pictures of weather phenomenon. Um, and yeah. mind you, after dark, they'll switch that over to night sky phenomenon very easily, I should imagine. So that, that's a great way to get people interested in the stars. And we, we really need to, to yeah. focus up on and that. Not just live TV. It's, uh, you know, we have a, uh, they have a 24 hour, uh, uh, I forget what the, after weather. <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically weather on repeat every 15 minutes. I've gotten some of my photos of wow. Uranus or Neptune in there and it's repeated every 15 minutes for the whole day or you know, it's a web article they have to write in the, the, their spare time that's not just on live air. So it can live in multiple content formats and really drive you back some traffic and awareness to your club and help you with the enrollment goals and, you know, really position yourself as a go-to club and, you know, association in your area by having it stamped, your name stamped on everything that the local TV station puts out when there's something big up to look at. <laughs> so... And that's that's the dream. I, I, I got to yeah. say, we've been wanting to do that for a while. I think we, we used to get good... Uh, media coverage at the uh, the our observatory, um, but they, I, I'm not sure why they quit. Either they grew bored, or they they got tired of getting yelled at for having bright lights and the 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 observing field every time they want to do a spot. I'm, I'm, and some conflict there. I'm I'm not sure, but I'd love to to get some people back out there doing more stories. We had some at the uh, uh, our event for the uh, conjunction uh, last month that uh, seemed to have gone over pretty well too. No. Yeah, I, uh, just a, just a word about that, Scott. I, I think the media coverage at the observatory is is basically the same level it's always been. They usually oh, okay. uh, they usually uh, get attracted to the one time or special events. Uh, uh, they came for the Great American Eclipse. They uh, uh, you know, uh, and they come for other stuff too. Um, this is uh, Chris Kersey. He's the uh, the director of our local observatory at Holland Road Park. Oh, great. But uh, yeah, I mean, we all have access to the, you know, the calendars for what's up, you know, what are all the major events uh, in each month for the coming month. If you, I, I gave my uh, meteorologist, I overlaid that with night sky events with NASA stuff. And there's a whole lot of stuff to talk about and you can make up your own list and add things onto it. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's really you're helping them get their job done, but you win in that respect because you're they, they depend on you for content and the details. My meteorologist is bouncing articles off me to make sure he wrote them correctly and the facts are straight. So it's and I'm doing my own research on the side. I'm not an engineer or scientist, but I'm doing my best to fact check it for him. And I've caught a couple of mistakes for him uh, before it hit the air, uh, which he really liked because that didn't make him look like a, a adult doing it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and mind you, yeah, every once in a while watching one of these articles and what they're talking about it on on the television, yeah, they'll, they'll get something very obvious wrong. And, uh, well, you can kind of let it slide because it's not the, the most important part of what they were saying. But, yeah, and it, it's the – I think the uh, one popular thing is uh, terminology is usually pretty wrong. They, they go with the, the most popular jargon instead of the, the one that seems the most appropriate. Um and it's also, you know, making sure they uh, make sure that they, when they call it a blue moon, people don't think it's actually blue, that kind of stuff. Which happens <laughs> a lot, um, which is, and, and the same thing with everybody assumes that only the harvest moons are gold or red. Um, like, yeah, I see that all the time. So this is the only time of the year where the moon is going to be red. Well, no, it's just going to be, it looks more likely to be red because of this. And that, a super moon is barely different to the casual observer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Versus that, that, that uh, a normal moon. <laughs> like the blood moon month name is like, oh, it's going to be an eclipse. No, that's the Native American month name. Yeah. It and just it, happens to be bigger this look a little bigger this year. And let's not forget the the ever famous Mars is going to be as big as the full moon in the night sky, <laughs> um, which yeah shows up every couple of years. Um, so. But I, I did a fun segment uh, with how to watch a meteor shower. Get a cot out, lay on your back. Just general viewing tips. You know where to point your feet, where to look. You know if you can get a view of the clear sky. Uh, I have a fun little segment. Um, 
that I did with them on that. Uh, but it's, uh, you tell people, hey, there's a meteor shower tonight. Great. Well, where do I look? You know, I, I can only see straight up because I got trees. Well, you need to get to an open field or something bigger. Yeah, it just general viewing tips and things that you all know. Uh, and if you convey that, that's uh, stuff that really makes a, a general article very realistic for an average uh, viewer. Um, it says, wow, I'm going to try this tonight. My kids, I, okay, I got a cot, I got a pair of binoculars, depending on what it is. Uh, or don't worry, you don't need a telescope or binoculars for this event. Just go out and enjoy, look up, get a blanket, <laughs> whatever you need to yeah, do. But a, a lot of people really do still enjoy looking through a telescope for a meteor shower, and you have to explain to them, no, this is not <laughs> the way it's done. Um, you, but you can. And it'd be spectacular if you get lucky, but yeah, no. Yeah. Um, but simple tips. Yeah, these are great bits of advice for interacting with the media, just to, to remember that the, the media is approaching the broadest target possible and just persistent um, and remembering that we're their friend and we're trying to do them a favor and they're doing us a favor yeah. in turn by, by just making it popular or, you know, so spreading the yeah, word. It certainly depends on your meteorologist and, and uh, if they're approachable and, and you know, a lot of them usually take viewer photos, things like that. And if you can, you know, create a couple of good relationships there and get your way into a station and, uh, and be a resource for all of them, um, that could be quite uh, fun. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm getting the koala from Ben. So that means that something something is amiss. Um, he, he's run out of his his favorite little background memes. And so he has to find new ways of telling me I'm going over. Um, so I'll ask <laughs> okay. for, for questions one more time and uh, then we'll we'll go ahead and uh, give our thanks to, to, to Mr. McGuire for coming and speaking to us. So are there any further questions? Marty, do you want to email the question to Kay about who would win the race or should I? I mean, hey, it was your you, event. Why don't you email no. Kay and copy me? My email is on uh, it's marty at backyardastronomyguy.com or we can put it in the Facebook group uh, that we have for the ambassadors. Or, or yeah, if, let's, if I'm let's do the Facebook group. If okay. I may, I would suggest both of y'all send the question in independently and not mention each other and cause another question for them to figure out. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's Ooh, a, I, a I like it. the suspicion that there's a lot of a lot of questions out there about this particular. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure um, the Mars landing team has nothing else to do right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to. Well, I mean, to be fair, for you know the next three weeks they're really just waiting for their their rocket to get into orbit so well I, I, they're going to have a separation coming up soon i think okay they've, they've um, been doing a lot of test runs and planning uh, i follow a couple of the folks on twitter from the entry descent landing team and they're sweating it out they're uh, going through their routines and running all these scenarios so uh yeah but it's a fun question the other rocket scientists can figure it out <laughs> yeah, they, they, they are the experts, and uh, it's if they've got a few time, a few minutes to to do a simple math problem, they, maybe something to help keep them from being a little bit less of nervous Nellies, because there's only so much they can do until it's either until it's made it. <laughs> okay, um, right. well, that sounds great. Uh, thank you very much for your time. It's been a, a very enjoyable meeting and it, it's, yeah, been it's been a pleasure, pleasure meeting you. With all of you and uh for anybody who's interested we're going to have the link to his uh web page and his, his social media on our web page and social media and uh we'll we'll link over so you can follow what else uh mr mcguire has been doing in, in his life um awesome so and uh, anything else you'd like to say nope thank you all very much for the opportunity it was great to meet you all and i look forward to keep following you all online great Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, end the stream and uh, dismiss okay. uh, Mr. McGuire so that he can get back to his family and uh, whatever else he wants to do for the evening. We'll continue on with our business meeting here it's or a little bit of a now. <laughs> uh, huh? Yeah. It's now that now that we're <laughs> we'll go ahead and drive Ben's other koala nuts and see if he can find some other uh, stuffed animal in the his within arm's reach to remind me that I'm, I'm being long winded and obnoxious. Not okay. not hard to do. Well, nope. have a good night, everyone. Enjoy All the right. rest of your meeting. Good night. Be well. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you.